thank you very much for these kind words of uh, introduction. I should say first uh, how deeply I feel honored by the occasion to talk to you tonight, uh, by the opportunity to present results of uh, joint excavations by Kuwaiti and Polish archaeologists and to speak to more general public than the narrow group of uh, professionals because what we are doing, our research is addressed not only to our colleagues but to people who live on the same soil as their ancestors and it's a privilege to discover the, the details of the, of the past on, of Kuwaitis, well, so-called Kuwaitis, for a so remote past. Uh, I would like to take you tonight uh, for a long trip in time and a short in space. Or in space, it's really short because even if you will be getting out of this building and looking to the right, you will be seeing the opposite side of Kuwaiti Bay and seven kilometers from the shore there is uh, this Bahra Wan site. Uh, for space it's quite uh, easy, it will be more complicated when we came to time because I will be taking you to the 7th millennium BC uh, and that's uh, time where we are just the, the last uh, period before invention of writing, before creation of the first cities, it means the last pre-urban period in the history of the world. We should be aware of the fact that uh, in the 6th, 5th, 4th millennia BC and even later. The Near East in general was most advanced part of the whole world. The civilization was really born here. In the sixth millennium, even Egypt was slightly retarded. I'm not take it, talking, uh, saying it by jealousy. No, 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 no. I'm a part, I, I'm a uh, partisan of Mesopotamian culture and its surroundings, but uh, well, in this time, uh, Egyptians should say that uh, they were a bit uh, behind what was going on in uh, a close neighborhood to, uh, to Kuwait. Uh, when you look at this chart, here you have the, his the history of Kuwait, well, starting with the period which in Mesopotamia it's labeled Ubaid period. The name is coming from the name of small locality in the south where for the first time British archaeologists discovered shirts which are characteristic for this culture. Uh, but what was really happening in the Arabian Peninsula? Uh, generally, that was a period called Arabian Neolithic. It means the peninsula was inhabited by wandering uh, or sometimes semi-nomadic pastoralists uh, wandering with their herds of goat, sheep, sometimes of cattle. And uh, if they were coming nearer to the shore, they were voluntarily seeking uh, sea snails to well, uh, add to their diet uh, something uh, special, something new. Anyway, they were far away from cultural point of view of inhabitants of southern Mesopotamia at the time. The, uh, in the framework of this period, between 5,000, more or less 5,500 to 4,000 before Christian era, functioned a culture which created the background, the foundation for the future urban society. What was the uh, reason of their success? It's for us still a kind of a mystery. They were uh, cultivating land using irrigation, which was doubling or even tripling their crops. They were 
building uh, quite complicated houses. They even introduced standardized plan of uh, dwellings, which was repeated with variations uh, across the whole Mesopotamia. They were first to use seals. Using of seals, it's not uh, just using of an animal, uh, invented object. It means there was necessity to mark personal within that the property by stamping uh, well, on the wet clay or on the boule closing uh, pack uh, package, uh, well, I know, a basket or something like this. Uh, it uh, signifies that there was a complex economy needing to distinguish between the owners of certain goods. What we have, or what did they had more? They were the Calcolytic period. What it means? People of Calcolytic period were the people who were already simultaneously with using stone for producing their basic tools. They were also using metals. It means uh, precisely copper. In southern Mesopotamia, archaeologists till now found only, well, quite slight traces of uh, usage of copper. But the copper was present in this culture and influenced the development of technology. The inhabitants of Arabian Peninsula of this time, uh, they were not using copper despite they were fully aware that in Oman, in, in certain chain of mountains in the western, northwestern uh, Oman, there is copper ore. You can work without melting it. It means you can w shape some objects on a cold mineral. That was the beginning of the metallurgy in, in, this, uh, in this area. On the uh, other side of the, of the Gulf, in Iran, there were, the development was following the de then development uh, in uh, southern Mesopotamia. The local variation, there were cultures like uh, Chogamish and later, so that's the labels archaeologists are introducing to, uh, to have the possibility to uh, put a bit in order in the chronology. So Chogamish was a locality giving name to a culture also with of the same kind of pottery as the one used by uh, Obit uh, people. Later, in the final phase, the Susa one, which was really corresponding to beginning of uh, urban life. That's just to give you the, the, to give you a, a picture of uh, the period in which all the important things that means important for the tonight's lecture really happened. Mm. Uh, to show you more details about the uh, Obeid period culture, so that's the painted pottery. They, uh, the Obeid people were using so-called slow potter's wheel, but it means that they increased in numbers, their pottery production. They were produ producing a lot of uh, vessels. They were from luxurious ones, decorated with very, very elaborated painted decorations, and, well, more simple, or even for domestic use, some undecorated, called common uh, ware, some uh, undecorated vessels. On the sites in the villages excavated by archaeologists in Mesopotamia, uh, south and north, we are finding uh, models of boats like this one you are seeing here. This one is coming from the city of Eridu, that's a Sumerian na name of a city which was considered as the oldest in the world. But there were others found in other obedient villages because there was no cities, they were all villages. They have producing also figurines, 
uh, most probably of, uh, well, it's used for cultic purposes playing certain role in their religion. Uh, that's, let's say, the original territory on which this Obit culture first developed. But if you see here in uh, Ilam, north, northwestern Iran, uh, their version of Obit culture was also successful. And then you can follow that's the zone of influence of the Obit culture. Uh, no, it was no migrations, no invasions. Local populations were adopting or whole or selected elements of the Obeid culture. Sometimes it is strange for us because this adoption of the new culture was connected with abandonment of old habits and old technologies. Sometimes those technologies were, from our point of view, much uh, better than the new ones. But maybe the quasi-industrial scale of production was this strong point of adopting, especially as far as uh, pottery is uh, concerned, uh, this new, new culture. It would be the problem of uh, the so-called fertile crescent leaving all the Gulf area a bit aside. If not findings along the southern coast, on the shore and sometimes inland, of numerous obedient shirts, quite easy to be recognized because they are, are painted, they are representing luxurious pottery, luxurious vessels of the time. And the number of these findings is showing quite intensive penetration of uh, Obit people into the Gulf area. Till now, well, let's say till the beginning of this uh, century, we, know not, we knew not much about the character of this penetration. There was a discussion if uh, the Obedians were trading in sea fishes and they were sailing far to buy fresh fishes. Uh, taking into account that they had a lot of fishes in South uh, Iraqi swamps and, uh, well, the sea fishes, they have also the shoreline, they don't need to, uh, to sail so far as uh, Bahrain to, to, to buy the fish. But the fact is that they were seeking something. And uh, even before concluding my lecture, I will say openly, we do not know what for. We have some hints, some hypotheses, but it's still not confirmed. Uh, but coming to Kuwaiti soil, finally. I should start by uh, saying some words about the first uh, Obeidian village discovered on Kuwaiti uh, shore. Uh, we are uh, very often calling uh, them, uh, well, the, those villages, Obeidian villages, but they should be properly called Ubaid culture related sites. Why? Because uh, for sure there was no Obeidian migration. There was a local population adopting certain elements of Obeid culture, just like in the case of the northern and western neighbors of Mesopotamia. The first village was discovered at the end of the last century and excavated for some seasons uh, with uh, participation of some persons which are present here. Uh, I mean Mr. Shahab, Abdullah Shahab by British mission led by Harrier Crawford and uh, Robert Carter. And this site, it was registered uh, under the cryptonym of H3. 
it looks like you know a, a name for a pro, I know technical product. Uh, I prefer myself the names connected with uh, with the ground. But H3, it's already accepted by archaeologists. It's quoted in uh, in archaeological handbooks. So there is not much to be done. It's a small village. You see the. the or remains of uh, houses uh, uncovered there. Uh, they were slight, well, nearly rounded, sometimes, as in this case, were quite rectangular, but with uh, rounded angles and such upsides uh, around it. There was a village of fishermen, and its importance, uh, it's uh, in uh, discovery of several small findings proving direct contact with Obeidian world. The first example is the famous clay model of clay boat, uh, slightly different from those found in Mesopotamia itself because it's flat bottomed. It means uh, it was used, maybe, well, I, we can know for some offerings, or uh, I'm excluding it was used as a toy. And the importance of uh, sailing, it's stressed by this small fragment of uh, pottery. In fact, originally, it was a center of a big plate where there was a kind of uh, floral motif with petals separated by this uh, elements. Uh, for unknown reasons, this plate was broken and the inhabitants of uh, H3 village made of this shirt a rounded plaque just to uh, keep the, uh, the resemblance to a boat, uh, except these two direct uh, connections with the seafaring. There was luxury pottery like these uh, cups, very thin walled. Imagine three millimeters thin. It's before the invention of China porcelain, and uh, the oldest pierced pearl found in on. Uh, Kuwaiti soil. Uh, discovery of H3 was a kind of an introduction to, uh, to revise, to rethink the character of contacts between uh, uh, Obedian Mesopotamia and the Gulf area. And then by, well, uh, a, a complex uh, uh, combination of coincidences on a Kuwaiti soil on invitation of the National Council for Culture, Arts and Letters appeared Polish archaeologists and uh, uh, our friend present here, Dr. Sultan Dweish, we got the offer to work on the Sabir, proposed us to explore a site he found himself during one of his uh, surveying, uh, survey travels across the desert. And uh, there was two places where he found on the surface some uh, remains of stone walls and uh, concentration of the broken uh, pieces of painted obit pottery. Uh, so we came to an area, it's here marked on the map. Uh, you can see it's uh, today, it's seven kilometers from Bahra to Bahra 1 to H3. And uh, originally there was two sides, one about, uh, well, 100 meters from the other. Uh, and they were registered under separate names before it, w it became evident that they are forming parts of the same settlement. Uh, sorry, not the direction. That's uh, the part 
that's the fencing protecting the side. There's another side uh, later with graves which were ex excavated by GCC combined archaeological mission. But here, on a distance of uh, well, 180 meters now, even more, are the uh, remains of a permanent village, permanent. Uh, residential archaeological site and we replace these two names SBH 38 SBH 35 by a joint common name Bahra 1. Uh, now you can see the Bahra 1 the state of uh, our excavations at the end of 2013 when this picture was taken from the west to the east, well, it's about 180 meters now with uh, areas excavated during the present campaign. Uh, we added more, some more meters to the uh, length of the site. Uh, at the bottom of a r chain of rocky hills, or rather ridges, on a terrace, people constructed several houses of different kind. I will be t showing you details in a moment. You see them. There is at least, uh, after this season, eight houses. That's the best uh, preserved. I will be talking about, about it in a moment. But you see here the remains of those so-called units. Each unit is a, a separate house. Uh, besides the houses, you have, uh, we have also found other uh, remains uh, I will be presenting later. That's the house one. The, uh, we, uh, we called it house one because uh, it was the first one we really explored with the participation of Dr. Duesch in person, working with a travel with us. That you see, it's a rectangular house. This house, it's, uh, well, composed of, uh, in the latest uh, phase, it's composed of 13 rooms, uh, and, uh, but, well, was not for, from the beginning. Uh, it's measuring 11 and a half by eight and eight and a half uh, meters, so it's quite uh, quite large. Uh, our excavations within this uh, the, this house show that uh, at the beginning it was composed of a single room. You see it here, and only later it was growing up more rooms were added and what's really interesting in some of them we found stone pavements it means they were using permanent floors made of stone you, you see uh, you see here this room it's interesting because in the middle of the room originally a single one there was a kind of a stone podium not very high we do not know really what was uh, its function. And later, adding the rooms on this side, it became longer than this part, than this part. Uh, and uh, in the last phase, uh, he took the shape you are seeing here. Mm. As I mentioned, the stone floors you're seeing here, that's the pavement in one of the rooms, but in another we found two pavements, one upon another. It means after a kind of restoration of the house, they renewed also the floors, adding a new one. But usually the floors are very difficult. We, we are really not real floors. We are the levels on which we are finding rubbish. But if they are horizontal, we know that was the layer on, people, on which people were walking, working, sleeping. And, well, usually that's a kind of a walking level. D 
discovered in one of the rooms of, uh, of, house, uh, of house one. Uh, usually, these uh, oh, houses were composed of uh, not less than six, uh, six rooms in their final, uh, in their final stage. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, uh, from this, uh, we, we can also say that usually the standard uh, size of the house was 13 by 9 meters. And more of them are keeping exactly in this, uh, in this, uh, in this frames. Uh, besides, uh, I should uh, point out that in the final stage, this house is resembling very closely the obedient concept of house. I was mentioning it was standardized. Uh, it means so-called tripartite house. It means three rows of rooms, or a central room and two rows uh, of rooms along it. While the houses from discovered uh, on H3 are really different in idea. It's not so regular. And what was we found of Bakra is the oldest example of so-called rectangular architecture in the whole Gulf area. The builders were quite experienced. Experienced because you see, we see different techniques used for erecting houses of uh, stone slabs, unworked. They were collecting the slabs from eroding hills. Usually they were eroding, well, in the form of slabs, but they are also kind of cobbles. So we see the walls which were made of horizontally flat, uh, lead, hor uh, horizontal lead flat stones, but also walls made of slabs put vertically in the ground. Sometimes they are composing kind of cases of large slabs filled with the smaller stones or using large stones to make a base for a superstructure. The remains we found till now are suggesting that uh, not all, not the whole walls were erected in stone because we are finding not enough uh, broken stones to, uh, to reconstruct the whole walls. We may suppose that the supper structures, the upper parts of the walls, were constructed of the local uh, beaten earth with, uh, with a bit of water. With this jubilee, it's very hard when it's drying. And that can explain why we have no other, uh, other parts. Uh, house one, it's uh, our uh, number one, not only because of the number, but because it was the first one discovered. But you see here the in the vicinities are uh, similar houses. That's two. Uh, you are the first to see the pictures because we were discovered this year. And uh, uh, even in the re regular reports, there is no, uh, not the picture of these houses. That's a fragment composed of two rooms. Uh, on this picture, it should be somewhere here. Then, in a close vicinity, another house with, with a room uh, paved with stones. Another one, there, the third one, and here was a kind of a courtyard. Uh, What's really astonishing and, uh, in the architecture of the, of the Bahrawan settlement is the fact that they were voluntarily using elements of a natural landscape. There were rocky ridges. OK, let's use rocky ridges as a part of the walls. Here, in between two such ridges, they inserted such a room. Uh, well, it's not very easy to uh, distinguish, but here you see the walls the walls, the walls, and in the middle an installation in the middle of the room. There was no much spending on these longitudinal walls. They, they were standing anyway. 
Oh, sorry, not not to this. Then we are coming to the really astonishing structure we started to explore some years ago, but we uh, finished already, or rather we approached the end uh, only this season. It's also fresh. Uh, it's uh, a structure, sorry, maybe the first picture would be better. The first fragments were composed of such a, well, semi-circular wall to which it joined, well, crescental in shape, crescental rooms. Uh, and on the other side, they were also rectangular ones. Uh, at the first glance, you are seeing that the, the walls is curved, but we are, we are not seeing it may be really a part of a circle. Uh, what's important, uh, most probably this part of the site, it's representing the oldest settlement on Bahra, as here we found remains of, you see here, 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 uh, fireplaces, open air fireplaces, which were all founded well below foundation level of the oldest walls. It means they were dug out before the first stone for the future walls was, uh, was even laid. This year we exposed the whole circle uh, and you can see, well, that's the top layer. You see the scattered stones of these stones here. Some still we, mu we must to continue. Uh, we can reconstruct a circle about 15 meters in diameter with empty space inside. Uh, I cannot answer sincerely why. What for was the circle? We cannot exclude any possibilities star starting with sacral function, a kind of a sanctuary, open air sanctuary, or something else. But it's also the first time such a, a structure was found on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Inside the, the rooms of the houses, we are not really finding any fireplaces. We are finding uh, installations, we are using this term, usually composed of some stones and rather uh, serving to keep warm vessels or something else, not on the floor but on another, uh, in an, in another uh, space. Uh, probably, maybe they were also uh, uh, trying to keep it warm uh, inside the room, and maybe also they were uh, simply warming up the, the room during the winter time. The installations uh, which needed use of uh, open fire were situated outside the village. Here are the western outskirts of the village itself, that the last here is the last house, the westernmost house we found. Is a concentration of 13 installations, different in shape. One was even protected by a kind of a, a fence. This was a square one, you see here its center. And on the northern uh, edge of the village, we, we, see, we see the same. It means that uh, most probably the roofing of the houses was made of reeds, anyway, um, of some material which uh, rather excluded use of uh, open fire uh, inside. What we are finding in these houses or around them? Of course, the pottery. Archaeologists are usually used finding pottery. There are shards of this mentioned several times, luxurious, obit uh, vessels. Fragments of the plates you see here, the reconstruction. That's kind of a rosette with petals of the same time as the one was, which was found on uh, H3. That was just such a fragment they cut it out of uh, the shirt. Uh, and you see complicated shapes typical for the painted obit uh, pottery. 
but there was also not uh, also not only the luxurious painted ware. We are finding also uh, the, the common obedient ware, the containers like these jars. Well, that's a fragment of a big, really big jar, of a big pot, which is well partly decorated, but uh, its size it's suggesting that it's really serving for storage purposes, or like this. And simultaneously, we are finding shirts of the so-called red coarse wear, that's the uh, archaeological slang, Arabian Neolithic parts. And the difference is clear. You see, the red ones are very limited uh, repertoire of shapes, mostly flat bottomed, and most of them f serving for cooking or uh, in any other way preparing, uh, preparing the food. In Bahra, we are seeing the domination of the Omeyid pottery. Over 60% of the shirts collected, and usually during one season we are collecting about 2,000 sh pot shirts. Uh, over 60% represents the obedient pottery. It means the pottery which was imported. On the side, on the spot, we didn't have uh, found any remains of, of pot making inside the village. Uh, those red ones were also taken from away, but it means from a center where such uh, vessels were produced. But there was not only pot shirts made of clay. They are spindle holes, uh, which are the best proof for spinning. It means for making threads for textiles. Uh, that's maybe also another one. And so-called flanged discs. This is a very strange thing, especially for us now, because it's a kind of an adornment. Uh, still, people in uh, some parts of the world, uh, for example in Oceania and Polynesia, are cutting lips to put such a flanged disc on the lip. Uh, and with age, it's uh, bigger and bigger. So that's, uh, that's a kind, those flanged discs are representing this kind of adornment. They, they could put, be been put also in the ears. And of course, we have some findings made of clay, the function of which remains unclear for us till now. Uh, we are waiting for uh, inspirations. Our colleague archaeologists working in this area were also helpless in this point. Uh, no prehistoric society, even at the threshold of using metals, could survive without tools made of stone. Uh, this is if majority of the tools we are finding in uh, on Bahra was made of local quartz and uh, the flints from Jalazor, except the arrowheads. The arrowheads are made of good quality imp imported flint. This flint was imported, well, from uh, part of it from, uh, let's say, uh, present Saudi Arabia, but sometimes even from the Zagros Mountains. Uh, and besides these arrows, which are necessary to explain uh, the hunting in the, in the village, we have knives. This one is made of imported obsidian. That's of local raw material that's imported, made of uh, uh, flint. The, it was not also the simple tools for cutting or shooting, but also for polishing, like the here, and pro possibly the bolas also for uh, hunting some of the animals in the desert. Such regular balls, but there are a few of them. But the majority of our findings are the shells. 
We are finding them by kilograms. You saw a fragment of a, of a walking level uh, inside the, uh, one of the houses. It was covered with shells. And mostly these strombus shells, but also different uh, the other kinds. But except that they, the snakes, uh, this uh, snails, sorry, which were, uh, to which the, the, these uh, shells belong, were eaten. These shells were used for massive production of beads. We, we, we had an impression some years ago that the only reason why this village on the desert was erected that, that somebody wanted to make their, a factory of beads because they are producing them uh, in nearly every corner of the village. They were mostly the tubu tubular ones, as you see pierced in the middle, but also such cut it out of these upper parts of the strombus shell, and several pendants also made of shell. Here, because we spent a bit of time studying their technology, we reconstructed the consecutive stages, how the beads were produced. So first, they were cutting the upper part, then uh, removing other parts till the center of the shell, then piercing a hole across it with such a small drills. You see the scale. These drills we are finding, well, not as, as much as the shells themselves, but they are really quite numerous in the side. And the final product was polished on such stones. We found uh, uh, three of them, if I remember well. And this bead production was really the major occupation which left us uh, or some traces. I showed you our findings, now it's time for conclusions, if you have to survive this lecture. Uh, who were the inhabitants of uh, Bahra? Certainly they were representing those Arabian Neolithic local populations. They adopted some elements of, uh, uh, well, better, higher developed culture of their neighbors. I'm still not entering into the problem of the character of the contacts. They adopted, but still very strong are the elements of local tradition. They are clearly visible in the architecture. Uh, the obedians, like most of the Mesopotamians through several millennia, were building in mud brick. But on Bahra, there was no mud to form the bricks. The only thing they have at their disposal were the stones. And to build in stone needs a deep knowledge how to use it, how to construct. I especially showed you this different form of construction because that's the proof that only the local people were masters in a building in stone. Of course, more complicated were the forms. They are also learning and developing techniques. But the people who used to produce, I know, uh, 20,000 of bricks to, to build a house, uh, it, in brick it's easy. They have the same shape. You can calculate the dimensions. When you are building such a wall, uh, you are uh, looking for stone which will be well fitting. It's uh, it's quite uh, quite an, an exploit. Uh, I promised in the title to say how they lived. First, they were lived in much better climatic conditions than we are now. Cl cl climate was milder. Uh, it means that the desert was covered by much more vegetal uh, life, example, species than now. The sea uh, level was higher, about, well, not less than two meters higher 
the now, it means that the Bahra settlement was not seven kilometers from the seashore, but only three kilometers from the seashore at the time. They were uh, pastoralists, I said it at the beginning. It means they were keeping herds of goats, sheep. They were eating them. We are finding the bones. They were using the, their wool as the spindle holes are uh, confirming also for producing textiles. They were uh, eating besides these goats and uh, sheep, they are eating some cattle, they were hunting gazelles and antelopes, and as you, you can judge after the number of shells I mentioned, they were eating sea snails, belonging to this marine gastropods family of strombos. Uh, it seems that it was the b basic element of the, day, of the daily diet, and the meat was only accompanying uh, this, uh, this, uh, this element. We know not much about the, the vegetal side of uh, their menu because, uh, well, we are working now on uh, floral remains and the, the research are underway. But uh, with the change of climate, we can be sure that was a lot of fruits uh, uh, they can collect uh, in the desert uh, at the time. There are, of course, also fishes. Well, the sea was not far away. Uh, we, uh, the community which lived in uh, Bahra settlement certainly was not smaller than 100 people. The number of houses I showed you, the expenditure of uh, energy, of effort needed to construct these houses and to, for a whole, whole production, it's suggesting that it couldn't be less numerous. The, the settlement was at least once victim of uh, such a flooding as the one which happens last year in Kuwait. We have uh, remains of houses which were destroyed by, well, this torrential flooding, a uh, kind of a what is cutting across the house, cutting not in modern times, cutting in antiquity, because they never tried to rebuild the house, they left the space open, and we are finding their fire installations over the ruins. It means they abandoned the place, considered it as unsecure, and they didn't like to risk once more. But uh, we are eliminating the, those abandoned houses from our account. It's, uh, our account is taking, uh, is using only the house which could uh, li function uh, in the same in the same time. What we cannot say, we cannot say why they selected this part of a semi-arid step because at the time. Uh, that was the Sabia, it was not desert, but semi arid step. Why the not nearer to the shore? Uh, and such a non numerous community was consuming a lot of food. It means they needed to eat also some imported food. These imported storage vessels may may have served for transport, you know, cereals from Mesopotamia. But if they will be remaining in a constant contact with Mesopotamian neighbors, is a question. In what they traded, in fact? What they have to sell? We know, we know what they have to buy. Or they were the largest producer and, well, monopolist on the market of shell beads across the whole Near East, which is quite a daring uh, conception. Or there was something which is a bit, uh, well, uh, omitting us some fact we, we, we cannot perceive for the moment. The fact that the 
we are finding this obedience shirts you can see here that's uh, H3 in the Bahra there are a long gap in northern part of uh, Saudi shore then a concentration here Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi coast smaller gap and then came the small villages across the Emirate, uh, Emirates coast and uh, it, it seems a quite reasonable hypothesis to assume that they were trying to import to Mesopotamia some copper. Some copper which in uh, contrary to the flint tool which when broken should be rather thrown away you can reuse, reform several times and maybe they were trying to get to the source of this material not maybe directly, maybe that was a zone of contact but if so, the first step in this chain was here in Kuwaiti near on the northern shore of the Kuwaiti Bay uh, I cannot promise that uh, future excavations, if there will be any uh, will solve the problems I, I'm, I was trying to uh, avoid during this presentation but uh, the excavation of Bahrawan not only shows that we have to deal here with the oldest and largest prehistoric settlement uh, in the whole Gulf area but that uh, we have an example of uh, cultural contact between two cultures and transmission of several ideas which were probably spreading from this area farther south. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.